Okay. Well, welcome. Um, today's webinar, the title is How Did Your Share Portfolio Perform in 2016? Um, yeah, so we're looking at a bit of retrospective, uh, what's happening over this year. You can also see there of the uh, subtitle, uh, it's a quote from Billy Wilder, hindsight is always 2020. And the reason why I put that uh, quote in is that uh, this is a saying which means that it's easy to know the right thing to do after something has happened but it's hard to predict the future. Um, so in other words, in a perfect understanding of events only after they've happened is what we, we refer to by uh, hindsight is 2020. Okay, so the idea here is, uh, and I can give another quote quickly, this is from, uh, from Abraham Lincoln, he says, I would find myself deeply uh, distressed if I lived in hindsight all the time. Okay, so it's like living life or watching the rearview mirror. Instead of going through, looking through the, wind, the windscreen. So he has another little quote. Um, curse the right place. And this is a quote from Milan Kundera. So he was a, he was a, a Czech-born uh, French writer. So we go through the present blindfolded. Only later when the blindfold is removed and we examine the past do we realize what we've been through and understand what it's mean. So yes, so we've had a uh, eventful year. Uh, been very volatile in the markets and things like that. But uh, saying that, you know, this is where I'm going to bring in another quote here. This is from David Zindel. And this is from a quote from his book, uh, The Broken God. Before, you are wise. After, you are wise. In between, you are otherwise. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yeah, as I say, it's been an eventful year. Um, if you look at the current situation, um, yeah, as we as we approach uh, the new year in, in two weeks, um, it's usually a good time this time of year to step back and look at your share port portfolio performance uh, in general. And I'll also refer to some slides a bit later. In general, the JC All Share Index had a lackluster year, as most of the shares uh, moved sideways in the narrow range in a fairly, I would say, fairly valued market. The market's not very cheap right now. Um, but uh, that is also due to a lot of uh, political uncertainty, both locally and uh, abroad, which um, obviously kept uh, investors on their toes. And we'll I'll highlight some more examples just now. So just because the market did not perform spectacularly well, does not mean that your portfolio performed uh, any worse. And I got an email from um, uh, Carl Matia, I don't know if he's on the website, uh, on, on his webinar, but uh, he says his portfolio is up more than 50%. And that's also despite uh, selling some shares. Um, and he wanted to know, do we have a specific um, call it calculation on a spreadsheet that will help us calculate returns and things like that? Um, so I'll be answering that question within the presentation. And the short answer is no, um, because there's a lot of very variables. Um, but uh, yeah, um, I'll be answering it a bit later in the presentation. So in this, in this webinar, we'll be discussing how your share portfolio actually performed and doing things differently to protect your portfolio next year. So yes, we're talking about hindsight, but my main focus today is, and I can highlight the word, is foresight. And foresight is the ability to predict what will happen or to be needed in the future. In other words, it's not necessarily a prophecy or a prediction. Um, it does not aim to predict the future, but rather it, it helps you to unveil um, the future as if it was predetermined. I hope that makes sense to you guys. But to help us build it, and, and this is where I'm looking at. So uh, I'm not focusing on percentages, if you're looking at, if, if that's what you guys were look, hoping for, uh, but rather it helps us to consider the future as something that we can create or shape rather than something that's already decided. So we're looking at various, I'm going to call them portfolio management strategies. Um, going forward and things like that, or I call them strategy, you can also call them as tools. But just uh, quickly, um, to give you a, a, a recap, um, it was an eventful year for obviously, first of all, the two big events on the global markets was Brexit, I think it was around about July, and obviously Trump uh, winning the US president, presidential elections here in uh, November. Both these events were totally unpredictable. It took the market by surprise, uh, took a lot of investors by surprise. Um, but uh, if you look back over the over the year, uh, yes, though, the, uh, there was no big um, market moves. It created a lot of volatility. Um, but uh, yeah, 
That's uh, if you look in our rear view mirror, um, it was two periods where we had a lot of uncertainty, a lot of uh, uh, volatility in the market. So going forward, obviously, we're looking at things like economic growth. I mean, the, US, the US economy is the gearbox of the global economy. So we're looking at economic growth coming from the states. So we're looking at um, uh, falling unemployment or rising unemployment, depends what's happening there. Uh, but also, we know in the next week or so, that we're talking about the US federal government the raising interest rates, you can see on that little slide there, uh, we were close to the bottom of the cycle. And the relationship of interest rates in the stock market, interest rates go up, market come down. Um, so also creating a lot of uncertainty. But I think to a large extent, the market has discounted uh, rising interest rates already, um, which is a, a sign that the economy is doing well. Um, but uh, general, generally, the, the market sentiment is bullish. Um, I would say it's generally bullish. And that's seen, you can see it in the Dow Jones Industrial Index making new record highs so, or trading at, new, at record highs at, at this point in time. Okay, so that's looking at the global space. Uh, locally, obviously, we had a lot of things on the political agenda. Uh, we had Zuma and Guptas. Uh, we had state capture. We had Provin Gordon, our Minister of Finance, being on the spotlight and also a lot to do with the state capture. Um, we had local uh, mutual elections that also surprised a lot of people. Um, we know we've got things that are, is, are we going ahead of the nuclear power stations? Where are we going to get the money from? I think uh, a lot of uncertainty around that. Um, we just recently now had a stay of execution with a ratings downgrade, but I still say it's on, 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 the, uh, on the agenda, so that still might happen. Um, but saying that, um, also I would say we're slightly more bullish, more positive, um, you know, there's a lot of sentiment that, uh, yes, we are going through economic recovery at the moment. Uh, but saying that, we're not out of the woods as yet. There's still a lot of uncertainty. So it's a bit of a wait and see if you look at what's happening in the local market. But I would say the, the general sentiment is, is moving towards more bullishness. Okay. So what's our deal situation? Um, oh, sorry, I forgot about this slide. Um, if we had to do a quick scan, and I'm looking from the 1st of January to, to, to yesterday's data, the... Uh, the shares that went up, I'm um, talking percentage, percentage growth. I've just now highlighted for you and just highlight certain trends. So first of all, obviously, we've got Taiwan and Avdorn. You can see they're both, uh, if you look in the middle here, what the, what the, what the last closing prices were, 1 in 10, it's in cents, and 85 cents. So Taiwan, by the way, um, went from 2 cents to 1 in 74, hence that 2,100% growth. Uh, Avdorn went from 1 cents to 91 cents. Now, a lot of you, some of you guys might be saying, wow, look at that kind of growth. Just understand these are shares that are very illiquid, number one. Number two, very risky. I don't know much about them myself, but uh, yes, those those things do happen. Um, but just be careful <laughs> with those kind of stocks. Um, if you look at more of the heavyweight blue chip shares, uh, Kumba Iron Ore, we're now 371%. You now, we're talking about the share going from 24 and 15 to over 181 rand. Uh, very recently. So better quality stocks. That's what I'm talking about here. But okay, Kumba Aino is a resource stocks. There's a Zor, There's um, Anglos. So you can see a lot more resource related stocks uh, in the growth side. Okay. One or two, you can see Barlow's went up 94%. Um, so uh, that's what I think is one of our, our bigger uh, industrial shares. But looking at the, the shares that have fallen, the other side of the scale, let's get rid of this. Uh, we see Mace Knight. Mace Knight, uh, they were shared to drop from 34 rand, or say 34 rand 99, to 98 cents, uh, hence the loss of 96%. Sen rand dropped from 2 rand 83 to 19 cents. Uh, the biggest heavyweight here, uh, PPC, you see also has again those little sh stocks, the share price. They small cap penny, penny stocks. Uh, PPC, 563, this was yesterday, uh, it dropped from 16 rand a share. It went as low as 4.87 recently and bounced back now to 5.63, but we down 62%. It's got a lot to do with what's happening with, it, with the boardroom and those shakeups there. A lot of uncertainty in the market, doesn't like uncertainty, and hence the, the sell off. And uh, the trend I noticed with these stocks here, apart from like Anchor and maybe Capco, uh, a, lot of, a lot of these stocks I don't know. Uh, they're more of the smaller cap stocks. Um, so these are all the second liners under the radar screen stocks. Okay, but uh, not too bad on the losses <laughs> as such. Okay, so what is our deal situation going forward now? Um, 
when we talk about, you know, this time of year being introspection, where, um, you know, we be, this change in the calendar years is due to many purveyors of what I call pop culture promoting reform and fresh thoughts. You know, with, at the lifestyle level, it's a cliche. We talk about New Year's resolutions, you know, um, and that's obviously, you know, we think about gym membership, uh, which is hardly ever used. So we see short-term hardship with a, a doubtful long-term benefit. So that's using that New Year's resolution. I think a lot of people will have it with losing weight in it. But um, saying that, it, it's, every effort should be put into managing your financial f affairs uh, to make a big difference uh, in your long-term outcomes. And this is what I want to focus on with this webinar today. So the vast uh, majority of, of investors are better served by investing in a share or call it unit trust funds that aim to deliver specific outcomes aligned to these specific needs rather, and I'm going to be touching it on just now, and I'm going to contradict myself, rather than shares of funds that with a narrow objective that limit your investment to specific asset classes or market sectors. So the idea is to focus more on, and we've spoken about this in the past webinars, where you want to focus on um, your investment objectives, your investment um, outcomes in that, be it uh, or buy a house, buy a car, my children's education, or even longer term, my retirement. That's what I mean by outcomes. Okay. So the investor has a, that has a clear understanding of her, his or her needs and invest appropriately, uh, the chances are you're going to be remain, you're going to remain committed more in the longer term. Okay. Especially in turbulent times. As I say, we had these big, uh, uh, volatile uh, times this year. A lot of invest, private investors got out of the market. A lot of guys are sitting on the sidelines waiting for the market to recover. And lo and behold, the market's going up higher and higher. So that's a, the, the challenge here. So the idea that you want to align your investor, uh, your time horizon with your investment philosophy and obviously ultimately with your investment approach, that will add value to you becoming more successful in the, in the market. Okay. So what I'm going to talk about today is being in a situation, when, as I mentioned now, your investment outcomes, having different investment products that's going to cater towards your, call it short-term, medium-term, or long-term uh, investment objectives. So as I say, house or car, uh, your children's education, and your retirement. So it's, it's different time horizons, different uh, your view on those different uh, horizons will uh, dictate your different investment products you'll be using. Um, but ultimately, within those, we talk about asset allocation, but ultimately, you want to manage your risk. So it's building up a diversified portfolio. So we're talking about asset allocation, um, diversification, the structure of your portfolios and things like that. And ultimately, you know, if you look at your portfolio right now, did you have capital growth? Did you beat inflation by a healthy margin this year? Number one. And number two, um, I like to have a portfolio that's, that gives me dividend income and growth in that income. So this is where I, I like, but I personally like to use what I call the magic of compounding, using that dividends now to reinvest back into the shares and grow my portfolio further. So this is where you know, we, we, we want to be, having that kind of um, investment portfolio. So how do we get there? So we're talking about portfolio management. So in addition to the question of what to buy, and sell and when. So obviously we're talking about fundamental analysis and technical analysis. It's also important to focus on strategy. So these are the, what I'm going to talk about today is not meant to be alternative to fundamental and technical analysis, but rather um, call it portfolio management strategies that are used in conjunction with those analytical methods. Okay. So the idea here is that even if you use fundamentals and technicals, there will be times where you'll be making some disastrous investment decisions. Okay, so the idea here is to safeguard yourself from total financial ruin. Okay, so when we use a safeguard by building an effective overall portfolio uh, that uses all these management strategies together. So, bottom line, to, to gain maximum benefit from your share portfolio, planning is important. And I've always spoken about this in the past. You know, the idea is that you don't just build up a share portfolio haphazard, uh, uh, haphazard fashion. The idea is that when you fit it in with your needs, with your available resources, and as I say, this will increase your chances of success. Yeah. So the idea is that 
you know, there's no hard and fast rules. Obviously, the, the, the choice of the shares in your portfolio is a, is a personal matter. But coming back to what I said just now, a planned portfolio has a far better chance of success than a list of randomly selected shares. Okay. So, first thing we want to look at is what I call asset allocation. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm piggybacking on um, what I said just now, where I said it's more a question of, of your individual needs uh, rather than a magical selection formula. But there's other factors that also be taken into, con in, into consideration. Obviously, the type of investment, uh, the, the um, and obviously the, the you know, fitting into your strategy. So uh, the asset allocation is, is, a, is a, I can call it adopted from the, the pension funds. Wherever it's bullish, the outlook for shares, you should be mainly obviously involved in the share market. Um, physical property, allocating some funds to physical property, some bonds, and to cash. But the funds, the majority is, is you want to be on the share market. If it's more bearish for the share market, when I say bearish, uh, you know, we're looking at a bearish trend, long-term trend, you know, turn day moving average, and you know, it takes longer to build up in a bull market, and it's a shorter period. The bear market is much shorter, but it's still a five-year period usually. So you'll have to allocate less funds to the share market and bear market. So this is when I talk about asset allocation. So you want to spread your risk along those, all those different asset classes. That's what I'm trying to highlight here. Okay. Then we talk about um, portfolio performance. And going back to what I mentioned just now from Carl Mathieu, and this is where the difficult thing is, there's no one uh, performance strategy. So you have to look at various benchmarks. You know, a benchmark is this is standard against which you measure the, perf the, the your performance of, of your portfolio or your investments. But the idea is to help you evaluate the performance of the put the performance of the portfolio, of the whole portfolio, rather than focusing on on individual investments. So we use benchmarks to compare portfolio performance to a passive strategy. When I say passive strategy, it's like a unit trust fund. Most of us that are on this webinar today, I presume, are share uh, holders in actual have a, a share portfolio, and there we're talking about a active investment strategy. And my, our objective here is to match or to beat certain benchmarks. And any difference will be reflected in the value of the strategy relative to that benchmark. Okay. So the challenge here is, and there's three, three questions you have to ask. How long is the investment period? Remember, my, my focus today is a buy and hold strategy with, regarding shares. I'm a long-term value investor. I have a buy and hold strategy. My view is longer term, much more longer term. So how long is the investment period? Uh, amount of time you invested your money for? My portfolio has been going for many, many years. So some of you might have just started out, but have that view. How long? Uh, you know, if you only started this year, then obviously the, the, the few months is, uh, that says has elapsed. If it's a bit longer, but take it over that time period. Second question you need to ask, and this is where the challenge comes in. Why is the portfolio rebalanced annually? So some of you might want to re and I suggest you, uh, we, uh, that's what I use in my portfolio. I rebalance my portfolio annually, bring it back to the original asset mixes. Um, and obviously, when I say asset mixes, my percentage holding in each share, so I don't want to have too much exposure to certain share, obviously be risk. Um, so, you know, the, the disadvantage that annual rebalancing can result in lower returns in some years, but also improve the performance in, volatile, in, in volatile times. Okay. And then also what's important, did you make any annual contribution? When I say annual contribution, I always believe in, yes, we've got a lump sum investment, but also... You know, I, I believe in, in paying yourself first. So 10% of my income every month goes into my investments. So um, that's why I'm talking about the contributions. When I say annual income contributions, it says monthly. So I'm adding to my investments all the time. So that's the one thing you can also skew the, 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 the calculation. And also, were there any withdrawals? Some of you might take the money out. Um, my portfolio, my strategy is to reinvest my dividends. Um, but also, you know, and I've said this in the past, in past webinars before, have different accounts for different strategies. I have a long-term investment strategy, buy and hold, and I have a separate trading accounts. My, if my single stock futures, CFDs, that's my trading and that's my income I use. Yes, there's, there's, there's tax implications, but um, 
the returns are much higher. Okay, that's what I suggest is just structure your portfolios like that from a tax point of view. I will touch on it a bit later. Okay, so this is just a very basic example of how you would structure a balanced portfolio. Um, we talk about the diversification, the spread, and we talk about the structure. Um, so going one step further, we talk about um, risk management. So this can be a, a second strategy after asset allocation. The whole idea here is to minimize what they call unsystematic risk. And unsystematic risk is the risk associated with the characteristics of one particular stock. So you don't want to have all your money just in one gold stock. You, know, you have one share in your portfolio, that stock goes down, your whole portfolio is affected. But now you add another share, now you're spreading the risk 50-50. Add another share, now it drops to 33 to 30%. Add another share, and so it goes on. So here's a very simple example. I've got eight shares, four large caps, so I call those my pillars, and you might have four uh, uh, mid caps. You can go one level down even further than that, is a further four small caps. Um, but I always suggest is create a portfolio on paper first, or structure your portfolio on paper first, and then try and find the shares that meet that criteria. So, yeah, I'm using example of 100,000 rand. I might allocate 50% or 50,000 to four the large caps. That's 12,500 rand to each. So then from there, I can work out how many shares to buy. I might allocate 40,000 40, to four mid cap stocks. That's 10,000 rand to each. By allocating less and less funds to the more riskier stocks. Um, as I say, you might go even a bit further, um, and you, you, know, you might have eight mid caps. So you might those might be your growth stocks and your top 40 or your blue chip shares. We we'll talk about it in more detail in the next few slides. But um, I always believe in having some money in cash for opportunities. Um, remember, also you're beginning you're beginning some cash from your dividends. But uh, the idea is that you always want to have some cash in your portfolio for opportunities that come along. You already be in a situation where you're fully invested. An opportunity comes along. You can sell one of your shares for the wrong reason. Okay, so we talk about spread as diversification. So it's spreading between three to five different sectors and between five and call it five and twelve different shares. Okay, that's why we talk about spread, diversifying the risk. We talk about structure. Now we're looking at a different way of looking at it. Is more along the lines of quality and your time frame. Okay, so I hope that makes it a bit more sense for you guys. Okay. So we talk about portfolio structuring, we talk about blue chips, green chips, and I call them green chips, uh, but they can be your growth stocks or your uh, green chips, and then also you get the red, what I call red chips, which are more speculative risky shares. But uh, you can see also how you, within your portfolio how you structure it, you allocate the vast majority of your shares towards you know, your money, your capital, to the good quality blue chip shares. Now, a blue chip share is usually a top 40 stock, uh, usually uh, it would be in the top 40 uh, index. They're usually popular with institutions. They have a long history of sound management and good profits. In other words, they'll be the household names. You've heard of Barlow's, you've heard of Anglo's, that kind of things. Um, ideally, you'll find that the blue chip shares, the capital value should keep up with the rate of inflation. So if the rate of inflation is 6%, you find that I always have the saying, elephants don't gallop, so they'll still grow every year by a minimum of, rate of, of the rate of inflation, but also giving you a steady dividend income every year. So those are, those are what I call the pillars of, of your portfolio. Okay. Um, the green chips or the growth stocks, um, I call these the second liners. These are usually the, uh, the mid-cap stocks. If you look at mid-caps, the next 60 companies, or if you look at the top 100, you've got the top 40, and then the next 60 companies, what I call the mid-caps, or the secondary shares. Um, so, yeah, you're focusing more on the, um, so they're still focusing on good quality, but slightly more speculative shares. they still soundly managed, they have excellent uh, prospects, but um, obviously have immense financial and historical, uh, uh, um, they don't really have it, compared to like the blue chips, they have that financial and historical stability. But they still have the potential to become blue chips in the future. Okay. So they, they are not usually insulated against economic recessions like the blue chip shares. You know, the blue chip shares are usually more globally, or global stocks, they're more rented stocks and that kind of stuff. But with these growth stocks, 
the expectation is that I want to double my money uh, within the next two to three years. That's the expectation when I talk about drove stocks. Um, when I, you know, are we talking about drove stocks, but just understand that, that we always talk about the style of investing. You want to invest in growth stocks. So you want to go for stocks that are not overly expensive. So on our website, you'll see the next slide. We talk about GARP, growth at a reasonable price. So there's tools that help you find these shares for you. And then obviously the red chips. Um, whoops, sorry. We go back. The red chips, split the stocks, allocating less funds to the more uh, risky stocks. But the idea here is that um, the focus... And, uh, you know, sometimes we might call them high risk or they call, you know, some of you might call them dogs. Just understand the dogs are the shares that were five rand and now one cent. They got no, no, no prospects. Uh, when I talk about uh, red chip shares, yes, they are small, they are speculative, but we're still looking at quality, not so much focusing on the value. I'm still looking at, and it's not so much quality rather, but I'm looking at things like interest cover. Uh, and I'm looking at things like cash flow relative to earnings, those kind of things. Those are the first things I look at, you know, before digging any more, any deeper. So you'll find that a lot of these companies, especially the small companies, are in difficult financial positions. Uh, the institutions usually frown upon them; they're under the radar screens. But you, can, you will be able to find these blue chip share, these uh, red chips that meet certain criteria. They are undervalued, they are profitable, have manageable risk, and will become a a, a growth stock or green chip, and then ultimately a, a blue chip share. But bottom line, you'll have a safe long term uh, return, a low return area. You'll have a medium-term growth area, and you'll have a high-risk short-term area. That's how you structure your portfolio. As I say, on our website, we have value filters and quality filters. They help you scan the market under the scan this morning. Uh, click on undervalued equity shares. You can see there's a list of stocks that, put, that will split out that are undervalued. You can see it by the share price. Some of them, uh, there will be a, a small-cap stock. Uh, there's another small-cap. One or two uh, uh, growth stocks or bit cap stocks in there, but it helps you to focus on opportunities and then from there, um, as I say, uh, with your share selection approach, uh, makes it a bit more easier when you create a watch list of potential winners um, and ultimately structure your portfolio along those lines. So this is looking at what I call value investing. Go one step further and growth at a reasonable price, what we call GARP. You see most of them are yellow according to the um, Legend there, uh, home, spa, home, uh, home choice, you can see it's undervalued. But so, yes, the focus is not so much on the peg ratio, it's more on the HEPs growth. They are performing more than 15%. But from this, as I say, you'll be focusing on creating a portfolio along the lines of, of quality as well as um, your, your, your structure uh, and things like that. Okay, I'm running out of time, so I'll just go quickly. It's important to review your portfolio, like what we're doing right now. So, it's important to think quality, not quantity. What I mean by that is, uh, when I say quality, is on how much, not how much time you're spending, but what you're looking at. Okay, so sorry, let me rephrase that. It's when I say quality, it's how much time as opposed to how often you're watching your portfolio. So, what are you looking at when you review your portfolio? The idea here is to avoid making knee-jerk reactions. Um, you'll see on the next slide. Um, how often you should look at it. I suggest minimum once a month. You know, a lot of guys look at it daily, don't look at it daily. Because the idea here is by checking your portfolio on a, on a daily scenario, you'll be making decisions, uh, as I say, knee -jerk, knee, knee jerk reactions to the market. So when you're looking at your portfolio, look for outliers that, that have really outperformed uh, and there's big, big, big changes in your portfolio. And then also look at those shares relative to the to the index and relative to the peers. If there's any big losses, you know you want to you want to look at that. And that's what's more important. So you want to uh, do a, have a closer look at that. But the biggest mistake most people would do is to sell out what is done poorly and put that money into what is done well. Don't do that. So um, you know, do your homework, find out why, look at the, uh, will it be a recovery situation, things like that. And that comes back to, um, in the next slide you'll see, some certain questions you want to be asking yourself. So I suggest at least once a month, um, some of the experts say maybe twice a year, um, 
if you're looking at unit trusts, if you have a unit trust portfolio, uh, that would be ideally to look on a quarterly uh, basis, because also the unit trust um, fund managers will be putting out a, a commentary. On our website, we have a funds A to Z that also looks at, at performance. Uh, and then maybe you can switch and things like that. Just be careful. Obviously, when you talk about rebalancing or switching, it means a transaction. There's a, there's a cost usually. There's also tax-related tax expenses. And uh, usually would translate into a drag on returns. But ultimately, it's a hassle to track what is your real performance if you're switching out, buying and selling the whole time. So keep things in balance. You know, I'd suggest it's much easier to, to adjust your contributions. And, you know, if you've got, you got capacity to add extra savings to your portfolio, it'd be much easier. And it direct most of those additional new investments to the underrepresented shares in your portfolio and bring yourself back to, to, to in line with the rest of the portfolio. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. So there's certain questions you need to ask yourself. Does the distribution of my shares or sectors uh, uh, need to be adjusted? So obviously the financial sector might have run on your financial shares or be done, do much better than your resources. But will there be a recovery situation on that kind of thing? That's what I mean by that question. Does the distribution, the spread within my portfolio still tie with my original investment strategy? Very important question to ask when it comes to reviewing your and rebalancing your portfolio. Are performances in line with my expectation? Now, if the market is underperformed and your shares performed in line with it, um, take it as yes, it's, 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 it's what could be expected in that scenario. If it's really underperformed by far, find out why, dig a bit deeper. Um, how does the latest information I have alter my expectations? So if the company's expect, uh, the, uh, the growth expectations are waning and there's no, you don't see any uh, recovery in sight, then we start looking at, yes, maybe it's time to sell. Okay. Uh, I still remember a long time ago with my, um, my, my portfolio, as I used to say to myself, okay, has my regional decision to buy the shit changed? Um, and if it has changed, uh, what has changed and do my further investigation. If it's a red edge stock, has a red recovered, and obviously the profit has been affected. I remember a scenario where Sasto was 500 rand a share, a pulled back nearly 50%. Uh, at 500 rand a share, it wasn't expensive, it was still fair value. So I thought it was cheap at 500, at just at even cheaper at 250 rand. So this is where you'll add to that position. Okay. And very important right at the bottom. Is any action required if, if uh, all is well, leave alone? Okay. You don't need to sell a share because you need the money. Um, you know, that's why we talk about trading. That's why they have a separate portfolio for that, separate trading portfolio. Okay. So, guys, I hope this um, benefits you. I was going to quickly go through the, the, the benefits. There's two main benefits from, from having portfolio management. Obviously, risk return advantages. Most investors obviously want to maximize the returns um, and minimize the risk, but also saying maximizing returns, that return must be de dependable, stable, and not vol uh, uh, subject to, to uncertainty. Okay. But um, obviously, if I buy and hold and I never sell anything, I want to be taxed. But uh, you want to structure your investments more tax efficient. So this will obviously uh, help you minimize the impact of taxes and obviously increase your net return. That's why also I believe in adding on, not just only having a share portfolio, but looking at things like unit trust wrapped up with things like retirement annuities and tax reinvestment plans because of the tax efficiency of those kind of investment products. Okay. So there's other things you might want to consider. If you look at quickly how the JC All Shares performed, this is going from the 1st of first of uh, January to, to yesterday. Uh, we're up for the year 3%. And that's looking at the JSC all share, all the shares for the year. With the highest our performance this year was 10%, the lowest we're down 6%. So if your performance, your share, a whole performance, whole portfolio performed more than 3% for the year, well done, congratulations. Breaking down a bit further, our top 40 stocks, if most of your stocks are big, big blue chip shares, at this point in time, uh, as I say, you're basically breaking even. This is until yesterday. 0.6% uh, down from the year. And then if you're mostly in the, in the mid caps, you're doing slightly bit better, yeah, your portfolio should be more in the region of 24% up for the year. And if you're more the risky side, the, the small caps, you're talking about 15% for the year. Okay. That's why you need that blend in your portfolio. 
Okay, what you lose in the swings, you make up on the roundabouts, as I would say. Okay, so guys, let me see what questions you guys have. I've gone over my, my time period. Let me see what kind of questions you guys have quickly here. Cool. Okay, Benjamin, great. Awesome, thank you. He's enjoyed my presentation. Uh, portfolio for 2017, we'll do that in the new year. Okay, Benjamin, cool. Okay, it looks like it's all the questions here. Awesome. Okay. Let me just wrap this up quickly. Okay. So what I want you to remember from this presentation is more the portfolio management strategies. So asset allocation, number one, portfolio management is diversification and the structure. When you talk about structure, is the quality of the shares in your portfolio, blue chips, green chips, and red chips, but also your time horizon. It fits into with your investment objectives. It's important to do a portfolio review. So hopefully with this presentation today, I've triggered that you need to look at that. Um, go look at, maybe consider rebalancing your portfolio. And obviously remember that the advantages of portfolio management is risk and reward. Is that trade-off between risk and reward. But ultimately remember, you want to build up a portfolio that is tax efficient. Okay. So thank you very much for being on this webinar. What's your next steps? If you haven't got an equity account with us at yet, please go click on that link. It'll give you all the information. The presentation will be sent out as PDF and recording, um, hopefully either today or tomorrow. And uh, yeah, um, guys, from my side, thank you very much for being on this webinar. There's my contact details if you guys want to get hold of me my email address. But thanks a lot for being on this webinar and for your support throughout the year. I'm taking a break again until the new year. Um, so we'll be setting up uh, the events calendar with upcoming events, uh, upcoming uh, webinars. But from my side, have a blessed Christmas and uh, all the best for the for new year. Uh, we can only get better. I'm optimistic for it. I'm hitting the, the, the ground running. So all the best from my side. Until we talk again, Keep well. Bye for now.